situation i hope we follow uh don't 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 sit on your questions always ask the questions you want to ask especially in the due course of our lesson and as usual we have our support uh in the chat section mr mkul will always be there to help those who are who are having problems but cannot speak it out through the microphone you can always ask your questions from the chat section someone is always there to 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 help you answer those questions meanwhile those who want to ask me directly you can ask me by first of all raising up your hand and then me asking you to unmute your microphone and then speak to to me or ask your your question all right now in the previous lessons i we were looking at the the computer output devices and we finished that now today we are going to look at computer processing devices and i'm just hoping that you can all see the screen i have shared i'm hoping that you can all see the screens i've shared now as usual we shall have this first session and the second session will come in immediately after this one ends and we shall join either using the the the, the pass the passcodes and the the user id my my id or you can just go and click on the same link i shared on your whatsapp group all right now when we talk about computer processing, we need to understand where we are coming from, all right? Now, in the introductory part of this, we talked about input devices. We, we looked at how input devices are actually put into the computer, what kind of devices do this input of data into the computer. And then we also looked at output devices, which are to deal with the output getting feedback from the computer after it doing something to the data we input into it okay so now we looked at the output devices which we finished last time now in this example here we are seeing an input device which is a microphone the microphone like i'm using right now to speak to you is inputting some kind of data now this data is what we call sound signals now this sound signal is sent into the computer uh, in form of the signals, it is going to be something is going to happen to this computer, this data which has been put into the computer before it is output as an MP3 audio to you guys to hear or for storage. Now, what kind of what thing happens to this data? Now, members, the very very most important part of the computer is what we are studying today. The brain of the computer is what we are studying today. And this brain is the is a microprocessor chip. It's a microprocessor chip that we call the processing device. And we call it as the central processing unit. Okay. So when the data comes into the computer, that thing that happens to this data is what we call the processing of this data. Okay. The data is going to be processed by what we call the CPU. Or what some people just define the uh, decide to um, expand the acronym to central processing unit or what we call the brain of the computer so this is a clear overview to what processing devices do they help in the processing of data so that we can come out with we can come up with something called information okay we know what data is we know what information is for those who don't remember data refers refers to the raw facts the raw numbers the raw figures which are kind of meaningless but can be processed by the processor to produce what we call information now this information is something which is meaningful we can understand it i gave examples of using names names are formulated from what we call letters in this kind of example the letters are what we call the kind of data now these letters will be processed to form a name like like bernard like mr robert these are all names which can be processed by the computer we also have figures we have figures which can uh, be processed to give meaningful which can be processed to give meaningful information for example salary of people who are working okay the ages your ages 
okay now the figures you have as your age have been processed to mean to be meaningful how meaningful are they they are depicting your age okay so that is just a brief introduction to what a processing device actually does now members when we talk about a processing unit there is one thing we have to be very very aware of now the processing device resides in a very specific in a very nice housing called a system unit now the system unit is a housing the system unit is a housing where we can find where we can find other parts of the computer now we, we have put it in this category of processing device because the main thing we look at inside there is what we call the central processing unit now the system unit is metallic okay it is metallic or sometimes plastic it's a plastic casing or housing the electronic components of the computer where the electronic components of the computer are held now it contains very very many components okay it contains very very many components now some of these components include the power supply unit because without the power we can't use the system unit okay so there must be something a component which is supposed to help us supply power or distribute the power to the systems to the other components in, th in this housing okay so it picks the, this power supply unit picks up the alternating current power okay we are running on all the elect i think uh, in your homes the kind of electricity we are using is what we call the kind of current we are using is what we call alternating current okay now it is because of this power unit that you know alternating current is not good for devices so they have to de devise a means of converting this alternating current power to something which is not alternating something which is direct okay so it is this power supply unit in the system unit which will convert this alternating powers to 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 what we call the direct to what we call the direct current okay now direct current is very very good so that uh computers don't mess up or the devices don't get messed up then we have the floppy disk drives we know what they are for for the they are for inserting floppy disks we have the cd-rom drives we have the local disk the hard local disk with the one which is inside the system power supply unit it is uh the central processing unit itself which we are very very much interested in today the system speakers sometimes are also they're actually embedded inside this housing unless it doesn't have the sound card or unless it doesn't have the speakers and then we can we can connect it to an external computer desk uh speaker okay then we have this the the, the mother the mother of these components the one we call the motherboard the one which contains all these integrates them and allows them to communicate with each other so all these components are embedded on a special kind of mother called the motherboard okay so the motherboard is in charge of making sure that all these components can communicate with each other okay now we're going to look at the motherboard and the cpu into details later but this is a, uh, a good uh, introduction for our system unit. Now, moving on, let's look at the motherboard. Okay. Now, members, I told you it is the motherboard, which is the most important part of the system unit because it 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 handles, it combines, it integrates all these other components we have been talking about. This power supply unit must be connected to this motherboard. Okay, the ROM itself must be connected to this motherboard. The CPU is embedded on this motherboard. Okay, every other part of the computer rests on the motherboard so the motherboard becomes a very good platform now you'll find in our real life situations that when a motherboard has an issue when a motherboard has an issue normally when you bring it to a computer person say you have brought it to me me i will tell you please don't waste time buy another computer because when the motherboard dies it's like your computer is useless okay now Many people 
uh, many people who have no idea of why we use the computers we use sometimes don't understand why someone would use someone would continue staying with the computer which has broken casings or which is which is not having a housing it's because this person knows the specifications how strong the motherboard is so you can find me with my very old laptop which is very very okay with me because i don't look at how old it is i look at how functional it is okay so the motherboard is very important in that when it gets a problem it's like you are losing your computer forever because buying a new motherboard for this same computer is going to cost you as much as buying a new computer or a new laptop so it is very important so some of these parts we see on embedded on the motherboard may include the memory slots Remember when we were talking about RAM and the and the and the ROM, we say we have what we call memory slots. The memory slots, members, can help you expand on your RAM. We talked about expansion of RAM as we are talking about uh, the output devices. So this memory slot, the memory slots allows us to add RAM to the motherboard or to the computer. So we insert it into the memory slots so that we can insert it, we can use the RAM. Okay. Now you'll come, you'll see that motherboards don't just come with one memory slot. They come with extra slots, which we call expansion slots. So these expansion slots allow us to add onto whatever the computer came with. Okay. Because trust me, if you buy a computer and it doesn't have a RAM, then you, are, you have bought a fake computer. Okay. Then we have what we call the AT connectors. These ones, we are not going to look at them so much. We're interested in the expansion slots and then the processor. And then other parts of the computer include the CPU socket, where the CPU is actually resting, okay? We have what we call the RAM memory sockets, the ones I talked about where we install the RAM. We have the ROM, okay? We have the IDE connectors. The IDE connectors are some cables we see there which connect uh, a certain component to another component, okay? Now we also have what we call the USB ports, the jumpers, the network adapter card and the network interface card slots, video adapter cards, the sound cards, every of these you, there are very many components you see on the motherboard, of which we can't mention all of them. Some of you probably know of other parts we can find on the motherboard. You can share it with us on the chat section if you know certain components which stay, which are which can be found on the motherboard. For example, I didn't talk about the BIOS, the the, 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 the CMOS battery. I didn't talk about it. Okay. I didn't talk about the North Bridge. There are so, so, so many in that when we try to mention all of them, we can take almost the full month just talking about the motherboard. Today, that's not our interest. Our interest is to go deep into what we see as the processor or the central processing unit. Now, the central processing unit, members, doesn't just work on its own. It has to work in connection with other components we can find on the motherboard so we are going to look at some of these important important parts of some of these important parts of the motherboard which are very important to the cpu's work okay the cpu's uh, activities it performs now number one Let's talk about the buses. Now, these are not the buses. This is not, we're not talking about Namiliango College bus. We're not talking about the the YY coaches. We're not talking about these buses that move on the on the road. Okay. Now, these are buses we find in the system unit. They are embedded onto the motherboard. Okay. Okay. Someone is just. I think someone is finding it. Uh, okay. Buses, members, buses are electrical channels, okay? They are electrical channels, meaning they allow current to pass through them. Eh? That allow different devices, all the various devices inside, inside a system unit or inside the motherboard, or embedded onto the motherboard to communicate, okay? So these components these different different components in the motherboard they communicate using what we call the buses now these buses transfer data between the different components in the computer system okay now normally uh 
it's okay you you can laugh but make sure we don't hear you can just laugh in your in your own place if you find something funny no one is stopping you from laughing you know here we are free and yeah, you can do anything except you have to do it in the good order eh? you are all allowed to laugh okay because when you laugh when you uh, when you laugh and your microphone is muted uh, it is okay so long as you are not hearing you okay all right so we have to understand that these buses come in two main types we have what we call the expansion and the system buses now expansion buses members these ones allow the cpu to communicate with the peripheral devices okay now this is where this is the part i normally say Whenever you come for my lessons, you come with a notebook to take down some notes, okay? Because now, here in the presentation, you won't say the definition, okay? But I've defined it already. Or in your notes, in the notes I shared with you, when we began our lessons, um, not today's lessons, the first lesson we had when we began it, I sent you uh, the notes for these lessons. For these uh, for these lessons before actually we reached here so the expansion slots are the ones which enable the central processing unit or the brain of the computer to communicate with the peripheral devices and the system buses members are the ones that connect the cpu to the memory okay now when we talk about memory we are talking about memory in two terms the ram and the hard disk these two are the ones we are interested in when we are talking about computer memory okay though in, in, in later on we shall even see that it's not only the ram and the the, 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 the the internal storage which is the hard disk which are in charge of which are in charge of memory we shall look at registers and uh, we'll see that registers are also a kind of memory which store information temporarily or some even store permanently all right so now the two parts of buses are the data buses and the address buses now we call them the way they are because when we talk about data buses we, since we say the buses are the ones which help these channels these components to communicate with each other then we know what data buses do because data data has to be moved between these components okay now since the buses are the ones that help to communicate with this that help in communication between these or among these components then data buses clearly can tell us that they are the ones in charge of transporting or transmitting this data from one component to the other now here we are talking about the real data for example the sound is going to be moved from the microphone to the processor using what we call using what we call the data buses okay the data buses are found in the system unit they are in charge of the communication so for them they communicate or they transmit the actual data meanwhile when we talk about address if someone asked you please give me your address okay give me your address what would you give him Probably some of you will even write the PO box. You write the PO box of probably Namliango College or your home, and then you even put the plot number there. So, in other words, you're just directing, you're directing someone to a place where you reside. Okay? It is the same thing here. When we talk about the address buses members, the address buses deals with the memory. Okay? It deals with where this data is supposed to be kept so you'll find that the buses they communicate or they transmit the information about where data should go in the computer memory okay that is that now when you look at our image here it is actually uh, representing how information moves now the address bu the address bus is making probably if we have our sound the sound i'm talking uh, the sound that is coming from my code right now, if it's moving from the micro uh, from the mem uh, from my from my my microphone to the microprocessor, from the microprocessor it has to go to memory, but that will be transferred using the data bus. Okay. Now, when someone else speaks from your end or looking at it from your end, you'll be able to hear whatever I am saying after it is kept somewhere and then moved to your microphone through the microprocessor okay so the data bus is in charge of moving the actual data and then we have the address buses okay 
Now, someone is asking what is meant by one stroke zero. Members, when you look at each device, okay? Each device, okay, in this case right now, this, this is not one, this is not, it is input, output, okay? Memory and input, output. This is stands for input, output. But when we talk about the one and one slash zero, you'll see that on each device, we actually have that symbol, though the one enters inside the zero. Sometimes it means the on and off, okay? On and off, zero and one, uh, meaning if it's on, current is moving. If it's off, current is not moving. Sometimes it also, you can also say it means power off or on, okay? So those, that's what it means. But in this case, this is input, output, okay? Input, stroke, output, memory, and input, stroke, output, okay? So here it is handling memory and input and output, okay? Input or output, all right? Now, moving on. Now, in the computer, like I told you, we have on the motherboard, we have what we call expansion slots. It is possible that you can buy, it is possible that, okay, it is possible that you can buy a computer which doesn't have a video card. Now, these computers, you'll find that it is very hard for you to even run your videos on it. It is very hard for you to even play your games on this system unit. Now, there are powerful computers which come with, which don't come with, which come with this, the, the, these cards already embedded in them on the motherboard. Or if they come without them, you can actually buy these cards so long as you know the specs or the specifications. You can buy this card and you install it on your system unit and you enjoy your system unit or the computer. Now, the expansion slots, the expansion slots are the sockets on the motherboard onto which expansion cards are plugged. Now, these expansion cards we talk about include the video cards, the network interface card, and the sound cards. If you have never seen how a video card looks like, this is a video card. Now, video cards normally come with their own processors called the GPU, okay? What we call the graphics processing unit. It is in charge of processing graphics, okay? Anything to do with graphics, your games, your images, your videos, graphics, so long as it's graphics, it's going to process mainly by the GPU. So we call it a dedicated memory because not it's not a must that all the images will need to be processed by the GPU or by, by a video card. Sometimes, sometimes even our processors, the normal ones, can process this information, can process this video, okay? because it is also a chip, it is a processor. But the ones that enhances, okay, it enhances the, uh, the process of processing these graphics is what we call the video card. So these video cards can actually be inserted into the computer expansion slots, okay? Then we have the sound cards. These ones are the ones in charge of sound. Right now, I am able to communicate to you through my microphone, which is connected to a sound card through the microphone pin, okay? I insert it in one of one of these holes, which is going to allow input or output. And then some of you are also using a microphone or a headset to listen to me, okay? So, so these cards are very, very important. So if you want to expand your system unit, you can actually buy more and insert them into the expansion slots and they will work perfectly as if it's one unit working. And then we have what we call the network interface card. This is how a network interface card looks like. Now in the computer labs, when you enter our computer lab at college, you'll see that at the back of every system unit, we see a certain port. That the port there is what we call, I hope you're looking at my pointer, it's pointing at a port, which is called the ethernet port. This ethernet port allows us to connect different devices to network different devices using an ethernet cable, okay? Then here we have a port which is for the coaxial cable. It only has, you'll also see this type of port on your, excuse me, on your DSTV, uh, DSTV, DSTV and the Go TV, uh, your Go TV things, okay? You'll see this kind of port where the coaxial cable will enter. So if 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 we're talking about this, then, then that means you'll have a clear picture of how a coaxial cable looks like black and it only has one copper wire, which is inserted into a single hole inside this port, okay? So this is how the network interface card 
looks like okay now moving on we have what we call now the computer ports now members we are able to connect to this computer motherboard uh, our external devices by making use of what we call these computer ports okay now these are sockets outside the computer or the system unit that connect to the expansion board on the inside of the system unit so these ports allow us to connect our external devices for example if you're using a wireless mouse now you know a wireless mouse has a, a receiver or what we call the transmitter we have to insert it into a port in order for us to use it on the computer okay now these ports are also the interface or the point of attachment to the system unit they help us to attach okay they help us to attach to the system unit now the connectors usually connect to the external devices like i told you now there are so many types of these ports we we, we know the serial port the parallel ports we have the usb port we have the usb port we also have what we call the small the small uh the small computer system interface port and then we also have the midi port okay the musical instrument digital interface that is what midi stands for port and then we also have the irda the infrared data association port. so we are going to look at these ports okay starting with the examples of computer ports moving on with the serial port is an example of those ports now some of you have been hearing serial ports but you actually confuse it with of you you're confused on how it looks like now what you must understand is that uh these images are for a serial port okay we have the serial ports and they look like this okay now these ports come in two types of course in order for you to connect one has to be a male port and the other has to be a female port so we call them males and female because of the way they are the ones that has pins is what we call the male port and then we have this one which is called the female port and these usually are used to connect devices that do not require fast data transmission for example the keyboard when i press a character i'm only transferring a byte okay a character is only a single byte even when i press the space key button on my keyboard it is only a byte when i click on the mouse okay it is only one click which has to be processed and you can't tell me that that click is a lot of bytes it's only one byte of information so when we need some when we need something to transfer only very little amount of data at a time or one bit of data at a time we need to use what we call the serial port now the serial ports you can find them on the on the system unit okay extending outside the system unit so they conform to either the rs3232 or the rs422 standard now these standards these standards only specify these standards only specify the number of pins used on the port connector so the connectors are mainly uh, made of 25 pins or nine pins okay so the males especially so now if we have a 25 pin male connector we can't get a nine a nine pin male connector which which is which is supposed to connect with a female which has less uh, holes for the pins to be uh, inserted into okay so now these pins this is how the serial port looks like okay so on your on your on your system units if you see a second port which looks like this that is what we call a serial port okay now we have what we call the parallel port now the parallel port almost looks like the serial port the only difference is that the the parallel port is capable of trans transmitting more data at a time compared to the serial port now many printers are connected to the system unit using this type of port okay because these ports can transmit eight bits of data simultaneously through eight separate lines okay in a single cable with a 25 pin female connector so this is how it looks like but you'll you'll see that nowadays in our modern technology in our modern world uh, we rarely use some of these ports because nowadays even the printers that come out use usb ports 
So it is the USB port which is now taking over these other ports. Now these other ports, we would find them on our system units, probably in school, in our computer labs. Okay, you 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 might even find you might even find that some of those system units on our computer lab don't have some of these ports we are talking about. Okay, so some of these ports were put there because. Uh, during the evolution of computers, we needed, we, you know, we keep on advancing in computing. So as we advance, you actually see that we omit certain things which were there in the, few, in the, in the past, okay? All right, so this is how a parallel port looks like. And then we have what we call, we have what we call, okay, someone is asking about Bluetooth printers. Now, Bluetooth printers, uh, you've just answered yourself in the same question. Uh, longer Bluetooth printers use Bluetooth to connect. Now, if they're using Bluetooth to connect, we know Bluetooth is a kind of, is a type of uh, network uh, we use for connecting devices, meaning the Bluetooth will be able to use the network interface card to connect these printers. Yeah, we have Bluetooth printers, which is true, but we don't connect them through ports. We use the Bluetooth technology or the microwave to, to, to microwaves to connect these to connect to these to connect to these devices okay so someone is asking what is the use of the hdmi port on some computers okay uh kevin charles now let's let's understand this when we have i just wish you 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 i i hope you are hearing me clearly i'm going to explain the hdmi now the hdmi port is very very important in a way that when you look at the old computers, our printer, our projectors in the computer lab anyway, when we connect the printer, I mean the projector to our system units, uh, when we are connecting our projector to the computers, we want to project information from, we connect them using two types of cables. One, we can use what we call the VGA cable, which uses a serial bus port to connect to these computers, to connect to the projectors. But the issue is, when you connect to a projector using a VGA cable, the one that uses a serial port, because it only transfers, it transfers little information, it will only be able to transfer, for example, when you try to play a video, it will only transfer the video without its audio. But the, 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 the way the, the HDMI cable works is not like that. So when we are using the HDMI ports and we connect our computers to the projectors using the HDMI cable, the HDMI cable is capable of transmitting both audio and video. So that is why we say the HDMI cable is different. And that's why we have the ports on most computers so that they can help us to transmit both audio and video. But now that means when you try to play a video from your computer, it is going to play with a sound from the projector because the projector will be able to display the information from the computer and it will also be able to play audios from the computer because the HDMI able also transmits audio. Okay, all right. Now let's move on to the, to the next slide. Now let's look at what we call the CSI port, or what we also know as the computer, uh, small computer system interface port. Now this interface port is better than the other ports we just looked at. The the, the, the other ports in like uh, except the USB, uh, this port works better than the parallel ports. Uh, also, the 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 it also works better uh, than the serial the serial port, okay? So now, when we look at the interface port, serial port, excuse me. When we look at the SCSI port, it transmits about 32 bits of, of data at a time. And they are used to connect devices like the printers and the disk drives because these devices require 
that information should be on data should be transmitted at a high speed. For example, when we're trying to copy work from the scripts, we shall use these ports because they can transmit at a two bit. But it's not a must that all devices, uh, the disk drives and so on, use this port for. Their, their devices, the disk device, disk drives, they, some of them we don't use, some of them use what we call the USB. So their devices vary accordingly. But there are devices that use this port for, for sharing data and so on. Now, let's look at the MIDI musical instrument digital interface ports. Now, we looked at the MIDI instruments in our, when we're looking at computer input devices. We said these devices are the ones that input sound or musical signals into our computer. Now, why we connect them to our computers? Because the computer is the one going to help us process or possibly even edit the sound we are inputting. Now, in order to connect these instruments to the computers, we make use of what we call the MIDI ports. Now, the MIDI ports look like this image I'm showing you, the ones I'm pointing at right now. This is how they look like. And they provide us a connection interface to the computers. Okay. So if you have your electric guitar, if you have your keyboard, if you have your uh, disc joker or your virtual disc, your virtual DJ uh, joker uh, device at home, and you want to connect it to your computer, we shall need certain ports like these. But it's not a must that all 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 the MIDI instruments or all the MIDI uh, devices connect using this. There are some which can also connect using the what the USB. Now. This interface is the one that helps MIDI instruments to connect to our computer. For example, um, the, the, the electric guitars connect them here. Yeah. Now, the funny thing is, or the most good, important thing you have to know is that sometimes you don't even have to know what kind of port you are supposed to do this in because they are labeled at times on the devices they come up with. For example, here we see the CSI port is, has, has been labeled that this is csi the c the scsi output port then the csi input port they are labeled for you to know all you have to do is know how they, they work or know which port to what to connect to those ports the same applies here we see we have midi out and in so we must understand how to connect them okay so most of the times uh this the system unit which has this kind of ports has the capability of even recording the sounds that have been created by the synthesizer. Now the synthesizer is the device through which the sound moves, okay? And then the processing this of the sound is going to be taking place at the computer side. The computer is going to process the sounds to create other new sounds, okay? All right, moving on to the next. Now we also have other ports called the IRDA ports, meaning uh, the, the, the acronym stands for Infrared Data Association Port. Now, in our previous lessons, we had, I remember talking slightly about the IRDA, the Infrared Data Association. Now, this is actually just a company which comes up with devices that use the infrared, uh, infrared waves to transmit data from one device to another. Now, the data is going to be transmitted, or this, communi this the communication between the devices that use this type of technology are going to happen wirelessly by making use of what we call the infrared light waves. So it allows the wireless devices to transmit data via the infrared light waves. So examples can include IRDA mouse, keyboard, and so on. Now, what you have to understand is that the port we are talking about here, the IRDA, is not just like um, any other port we would know that we are supposed to insert something. The port becomes uh, becomes a, a part which is supposed to which is supposed to transmit the light waves. Okay, so meaning we can connect. For example, when you look at this image, we can connect this that, that adapter to our computer using other ports. For example, here we are using the serial port. So we require the serial port to connect to a certain computer such that it can be able to excuse me such that it can be able to transmit uh, the infrared the infrared waves to the devices to which it's supposed to be connected. So this part becomes the, the port, okay? but it's not the port we normally think is where we have to insert something and so on. Okay, so that becomes the port, right? 
Now we also have what we call the fire wire or what we call the 1394 port. Now these can connect to multiple multiple devices that require fast data, that require fast data transmission. That's why we normally use them to connect to games and and so on, so on. Okay. Now this this type of this type of this type of port normally connects multiple types of devices. Okay. Now the multiple type of devices normally can be in in many many numbers just like the usb can be connected to several several other devices this also allows the several devices to be connected to it one at a time okay all right now let's move on to what we call the processing hardware what we are very much interested in and today the cpu the brain of the computer now members what we must understand is that the brain of the computer is just like our human brain meaning we have to take care of it the way you would wake up in the morning to take your gut so that your your brain is functioning well the way you want to have enough sleep so that you have a well function the way you keep clean is the way you try to maintain your brain to be in good working condition the same thing applies here in our computer hardware we have to make sure we keep the cpu in a good working state such that we obtain the best results out of data that is being processed by it Okay. Now we know it is this is the brain of the computer, meaning if it's not in a good working condition, it's not going to do its work well. Sometimes you find the central processing unit overheating, and because of that, the computer can just black out. Okay, it just switches itself out because the CPU now is not in a good working state. Now, that just like us, if you don't take care of your brain, okay, if you're a human being and you don't take care of your brain, or probably something happens to your brain you'll see that the body it, it ceases to manage, it ceases to function in a normal way that's why you find people eating things from the dustbin and so on so we have people who are mentally ill those are people who have problems with their central processing unit which is their brain okay so the same thing applies that when we have a problem with the cpu it's going to affect the performance of our what our devices our computers so what you know you will have to understand is that this is the area where the control and execution of all computer operations happens okay when you put in a, an input it has to be even when you're starting the operating system it has to be processed by the cpu before it actually starts okay so it is very very the, the most important part of the the components on the motherboard without it we don't have a computer working okay so if for, for example now if we are trying to access data from a memory okay the data has to be accessed from the memory. That means the CPU has to ensure that it comes up with certain processes that are going to fetch this information from the memory and then carries it to the intended, intended places where it's needed. For example, if we want to fetch the data from memory just to display it, it's going to fetch it. It's going to create the processes that are going to fetch the data and then play it out for us to, to view. Then. It, if you also want to store it in another memory, it has to transfer it from one memory to another. That is why the CPU is uh, regarded as the brain of the computer. It is in charge of all the computer operations. Okay. Now, here when you look at this, this screen I've just shared, um, you'll actually see that you'll actually see that uh, this other image is not exactly how a CPU looks like. However, this other image on the right is telling you how the CPU works. Now, the CPU looks, you can even see the person who is holding the CPU is holding it with a lot of care, holding it at the corners so that it doesn't, it doesn't maybe probably break certain pins on it, even wearing a glove so that it, it can hold it. So you see it's taking a very good care of the brain of that computer. This is how the CPU looks like. All right. Now, the CPU doesn't do its work just like that it has certain components with which it does its work so these components all work as a unit for the cpu to perform its work properly okay now the cpu is composed of three main parts we have what we call the arithmetic logic unit the control unit the registers or the accumulators now the accumulators we are going to understand why we have said registers or accumulators okay. now moving on 
here is a diagram of how the central processing unit actually does its work. We said it has three components, the control unit, the arithmetic logic unit, and the memory unit or where, where the memory is supposed to be. Then down here we have what we call the backing store. Okay, we have the backing store. Now, of course, the central processing unit or the CPU wouldn't be a CPU if there was nothing it is processing. Okay, it has to process certain things, certain things like what the input. When an input enters the computer, it has to be processed by the computer, this, the CPU itself. And the processing happens by making use of its components, depending on what kind of input it is. And then it can therefore be output for us to view on our output devices, or it can be stored for future reference. Okay. So this is a, a diagram just to show you how to show you how the CPU works all at one, uh, like as a unit. Okay. All right, now let's move on to see these devices. Okay, now we have what we call the arithmetic logic unit, or what some people would refer to call as the ALU, or other people just say the ALU. Now we would have to understand from the word arithmetic in your mathematics, you know, when something is to do with arithmetic, we are talking about mathematical operations. Okay, now. This part of this component of the CPU is in charge of performing calculations and other mathematical operations. But of course, mathematical operations involve logic, okay? Logic, because there are certain components, there are certain parts of math where we include logic, okay? Now, we make use of certain operators. Okay. We make use of certain operators in mathematics. We have the plus symbol, the minus, the asterisks, the division, and so on. We even have what we call the modulus, which takes the shape, which takes the symbol of the percent. Okay. It's called the modulus. In programming, when you move on in the education computer, you'll find that the modulus is an operator we use to capture the remainders of the remainders of numbers we divide. Okay. So when you say Two modulus five means you capture the remainder of whatever division you get. Now, logical operators, however, involve when we are dealing with comparison of phenomena. For example, I always like to use a more as an example. Now, a more, if I would say a more is shorter than uh, mayanja, okay? Mayanja is taller than a more. Now, you feel there's some logic here. If we are to express that in mathematical terms, we make use of certain symbols. For example, the greater than the sign, the, the greater than sign, the less than sign, or the equal to sign. If Amo and Mayanja are of the same height. Okay? Now, if, if Amo is shorter, we are going to use Amo's height is less than Mayanja's height. Now, that is where the logic comes. Or even in the future, we have what we call the logical and, the logical or. Okay, the logical and we make use of two symbols of the and the two and symbols we put them together to mean a logical operator. We even have a question mark, it also becomes an operator which is logical. That is if you continue with program. So the logical unit, the, uh, the logical arithmetic logical unit is in charge of those mathematical and logical operations of the central processing unit. Now, the other component, however is what we call the control unit. Now, the control unit is actually the main component of the CPU because it performs all these functions of fetching and sending commands to the system devices and peripherals. All the peripherals we are using that are connected to our computers have to be processed through the control unit. The control unit has to make sure that these commands we send from the keyboard when we press a key is sent to be processed by the CPU to depict whatever we have pressed. When I click a button on the mouse, it is the control unit to process what button I've pressed. Click what on what I've clicked it and how it's supposed to perform its job. Now, it also interprets commands. It is the intermediary between the user and the computer. Okay, that is still the control unit. Now, when we talk about the control unit controlling and timing all tasks by the CPU, typical of multitasking where processor time is shared among competing tasks, we have to understand that this is where we look at scheduling of the control unit. Now, members, scheduling, I will give an example of our computer lab in the, in the Great Namiliango College. 
if you enter the computer lab you will notice that our computers have been networked now imagine we have a printer connected to that network and you are all in a practical exam but it so happens that we are using only one printer to print the the output of our information okay or our our exam we have finished doing now if it happens that three students all at once tried to print they are going to send instructions to this printer like i told you before in our output devices the printer is going to save this information temporarily in what we call a buffer a temporary storage it has and then it uses what we call the control unit and then identifies which instruction came in first even if you all try to press the button print at a go there's that little time lapse which might be in seconds it is what the cpu or the control unit will use to identify which information or which instruction came in first which instruction came in second and which instruction came in third or last okay then it uses that to print accordingly so that is why we say it is the one in charge of controlling or which we could simply say it is in charge of scheduling okay and then it also directs the movement so signals between the cpu for example electric signals between the cpu the input memory and devices and so on okay so the cpu acts as a traffic warden okay and this activity or this operation is done by is performed by it's performed by the control the control unit okay now um okay moving on okay all right now let's go to the next slide next slide we see the, what we call the registers now members the registers are very high tradition additional high speed storage locations on the central processing unit now whenever we are dealing with our programs when we are running programs okay we store some of these processes in what we call registers now for some of you who will continue ahead with the computer knowledge or computer education you will actually find that when you're going to learn about machine languages we are going to deal mostly with the registers Okay, we're going to deal mostly with registers. This is where we find information is being moved from one register to another. We are just exchanging information. It is actually programming in what we call machine language. So when we are learning machine languages, we can actually manipulate whatever is stored in the register. Now we have what we call a registry on our operating systems, especially the Windows, Windows operating system. We have what we call a registry where we can actually see these registers doing its work. When you open the registry, if I'm just to show you how a registry can be open, how a registry can be open, you can either open it by typing uh, in the run command window by typing the command reg edit by typing in the command reg edit and then pressing pressing the enter button but be careful whatever you change in the register okay now here is how the register looks like okay the registry now our windows of register now here the information which is kept here is information which is kept on our registers okay the registers and accumulators and many many other types of registers are, are used are being used here to keep information safe okay now someone someone was asking someone asked a question in the chat section about someone asked a question about the register uh for manipulating changing changing memory size of a register from for a graphics processing unit what if the gpu has no what if the gpu what if the computer has no graphics process how come the register okay now um for the register to be available these registers are not just created and it's not a must that every computer will come out with a dedicated graphics card 
though we have we have computers that come with dedicated uh, graphics cards it doesn't mean computers that don't have dedicated graphics cards don't have graphics but the processor the central processing unit we have also has the capability of processing graphics so as it processes the graphics though the capabilities are going to be limited compared to the dedicated ones for example the nvidia's and the, the radeon's graphics cards it is going to of course the range has to be there because we are dealing with graphics okay and without graphics how would we even be able to view things on our screen okay so this has to be processed graphics has to be processed though we need confiscated info uh, so to, uh, other other processors like the gpus to process highly big confiscated graphics like in games and so on okay so this is how it is but members be very careful not to change information in the registry because you can crash just the operating system from changing altering certain values in the registry okay all right now let's move on with our with our presentation let's move on with our presentation okay so that is how the register works so the examples of registers include the program counter the instruction registrar, the instruction decoder, even we have the accumulators and status registers. So these registers are additional high-speed storage locations we find on the CPU or in the CPU. Okay. Now, we also have a part of the CPU component which we don't consider among the theory is what we call the system clock. Now, the system clock is the one in charge of controlling how fast operations in the computer take place or how long the computer computers can take uh, to process a certain data or information okay and the system clock is in terms of it's measured in terms of megahertz okay now megahertz is mainly used to to specify the speed of our computer that's why when you go to the market to buy a computer we look at processor speed the processor speed is is taking us to what we call the system clock. how long it can take to process and uh, a program or a process how long it can take to process a process okay that is the work of the system clock now let's look at the examples of processes in the market now very many computers have come up with different processors though some people don't know the kind of processors their own devices are even running so we have the examples the examples include the intel 8085 these are one of the late the old processors which were developed by intel we have intel atom there are so many processors on the market intel atom we only find them in the mini computers mini computers that are running intel processor atom we have intel Celeron. we have pentium one two three and four or what we can just term as excuse me term as the intel pentium series okay and then we have the pentium duo core we have cyrix we have motorola and so on and so on but now members when it comes to the types of processors or the processors available in the market we look at two main companies we look at the md and intel that are the main two competitors when it comes to the production of processor chips okay we have the amd which produces uh processors like the ryzen ryzen 3 ryzen 5 of course with also their graphics card this one the amds run the radeon graphics cards and then the intel has other types of graphics like the nvidia and so on. so these two companies the intel and the amd are the two companies which are competing during when when we look at production of processor chips of course we also have the other companies like the motorola this is how their chips look like for example this is a motorola xc 680 for the and so on so um this is how processors for Motorola to play. Like. Then we also have the central processing unit for for the I, Intel i series. Okay, we have the i5, i3. We even now have i9 X series. Okay, then there is also i3. After the dual core, we have the i3, the i5. So all these are examples of processors in the market. Meaning, when you go to purchase a computer in the market, you must know what processor, actually, what computer, what processor is running in this computer. Normally, we are able to know this by looking at certain markings on the computer, just below the man, the keyboard, or on the right side of the of the of the tab. It doesn't doesn't matter where they put it, but mostly you can see on the computer, on the surface, 
where we can see the type of operating uh, the type of processor it's running including the generation so if it has a graphics card you'll also see that the they have, they have marked what type of graphics card is running there. If it's NVIDIA GeForce, it will be there. It's an MD Radeon display. So whenever you're buying, buying these things, you have to know. Okay? You have to understand what you're buying. So sometimes they even allow you to switch it on and you can access the properties of this computer. Okay. Now, to make, to make access easier, we use certain commands. For example, we can use the command DX diag in your in your in your what in your run window okay you open the run window and then you type dx diag and press enter to see the properties of your computer okay all right so that is the cpu now let's look at the computer hardware problem computer hardware we don't last okay forever like we don't last forever, also these are rare. Time will come when they'll get spoiled. Time will come when certain problems lead to their malfunction. Now here we are looking at the problem. Now, when we're running hardware on excessively low or high temperature, these low or high temperatures, extremely low or excessively low or high temperatures can cause a lot of circuit bus or circuit or bus cracks. Even sometimes the connections break and chip some chips also clips and small movement dislocation and so on you know heat causes either something to expand or to contract now if the temperature is too high certain things will expand certain parts of the of the hardware will expand probably sometimes they even crack and so on and so on then we also have the effect of dust when dust builds up in the computer or in the slots sometimes the computers or the slots fail to identify the devices which have been inserted there or when the dust is accumulated on the central processing unit it causes overheating of the central processing unit which may lead to the computer just blacking out all of a sudden so dust coatings can cause unnecessary heat data or data and electric insulation so the only way you can avoid this is to always use a blower to clean dust or you can do gently brush it off using a small smooth brush to move the did that okay all right then we also have what we call effects of corrosion of course corrosion happens in metals okay when metals come in contact with water in your chemistry we learned that there will be some kind of reaction which leads to corrosion and this corrosion can cause can cause uh hardware problems okay so uh, this causes rust rust causes the metals to become weak and sometimes even break then we also see other problems like the magnetic field, uh, which can cause magnetic inductions, the electrical noise, electromagnetic interference, electrical powers, all these lead to hardware problems, okay? So for today, uh, this is where our lesson ends and that will mark the end of our computer processor, uh, processing devices. I thank you all for attending. I thank Mr. Mkulu, our head of department, for attending the lesson with us. Have a great day. If there are no more questions, I'll ask us to stop here until next week, same day, same time. Have a good day.